Top secret Pentagon documents were released to a chat site, and eventually the mainstream media picked it up. Now it's a very big story. Today we're going to talk about these documents, these top secret documents, as they pertain to the Ukraine war, what they tell us, what they don't tell us, what we don't know, and what we do know. Welcome to this week's episode of The Socialist Program. I'm your host, Brian Becker. If you enjoy this show, if you rely on this show, please become a patron at patreon.com forward slash The Socialist Program. Welcome to this week's episode. We're talking today with Walter Smolarek. Walter is a news analyst. He's the editor of Liberation News. Walter Smolarek, welcome back. Thanks very much for having me. Happy to be here. Um, Walter, big news. Uh, the documents were released on a social, well, not a social media site, a chat site, Discord, apparently, uh, uh, several months ago. And apparently they've been talked about by a small group of people who are on that chat site. It took a while for the mainstream media and for the government to actually realize that these documents were there. According to the story, we're going to talk about the story because we have to approach the story with a certain degree of skepticism. But if the documents are true, they do give one an inside look into the Pentagon's assessment of the Ukraine war. And that's important because their internal assessment, what they're saying to each other, is going to be, in most cases, far different from what they're telling the public. You have an important article, a major article on Liberation News website, and you're the editor at that site. The headline is, Leaked Pentagon Documents, a Snapshot of the Inner Workings of Empire, but then you have a question mark at the end of the headline. So first of all, let's talk about the documents. Uh, I want to talk, we're going to go sort of a deep dive about what some of them say. Why the question mark? Right. Well, I mean, this is a very mysterious story with lots of bizarre twists and turns to it. Uh, we don't know a lot about these documents, and there's a lot of missing pieces here. Uh, if these are true, it tells us something, a lot of things that are highly, highly significant, politically explosive. But we also have to account for the possibility that, well, maybe this is in part or in whole disinformation, right? Uh, you know, we know that a member of the Massachusetts Air National Guard has been arrested. He's been charged under the Espionage Act. He's been, you know, identified in the media as the leaker. But, you know, we should still be open to the possibility that some of this information could have been perhaps planted by the U.S. government. Uh, is this disinformation? Is this a way to put uh, information out there that the adversaries of the U.S. government might consider to be true and then act on that uh, in a way that ends up being destructive to their own interests. Um, that's a possibility and it's something that, you know, modern militaries uh, all have some degree of, uh, of an approach to. But if we assume that the information in these documents are true or mostly true, it tells us the public extremely important things. Uh, for instance, it gives us uh, a realistic snapshot of the state of the Ukraine war or a realistic picture of the Ukraine war, uh, far different than what we're being told in public by the politicians, by the Biden administration. So one of the many things in these uh, leaked Pentagon documents are casualty counts, right? That uh, tens of thousands of Russian soldiers and tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers have been killed or wounded, that the scale of the war is truly horrific and that the war is in a stalemate. The idea that Ukraine will be able to pull off a quick victory, expel Russia from Crimea, expel Russia from the Donbass. Uh, in all of these documents, the authors or purported authors who are you know, intelligence and military officials uh, are essentially scoffing at that idea, that, that essentially under no scenario could they see that type of decisive victory happening, even though the US public who is being asked to underwrite this war, to pay for this war effectively, uh, is being told exactly the opposite. Uh, I think that's that's extremely important. All right. So again, for the people watching this show or listening to this show, approach a story like this with a high degree of skepticism because we don't know whether these leaked documents, again, first on a chat site, 
whether they're true, fully true, or partly true. And it's also possible, as you're saying, Walter, that the Pentagon, the Pentagon could have released the documents, including a lot of true information, but including in that true information is some disinformation with its own intention, with its own malign intention from the point of view of how uh, America's adversaries, in this case Russia, will treat the war or treat the documents. For instance, one of the documents talks at length, and these documents have come out in sort of dribs and drabs, it wasn't all at one time, about infighting within the Kremlin and disagreements between Putin and his advisors and disagreements between the Russian intelligence services and the military. You could see how some of these documents could uh, be designed to create discord uh, within, the, within the Russian administration. Very, very possible. On the other hand, there are parts of these documents which seem to be very against what the United States would like people to think about the Ukraine war. Here's one. And Newsweek uh, magazine did a release of 20 of the key documents. They labeled it, and then they produced the documents and also did their own sort of summary assessment of it. Here's one. Diminishing political will in Europe. Okay, you got that diminishing political will in Europe. Here's what it says from the Newsweek summary. This document lays out continuing European support for Ukraine country by country and contains no surprises. Then it goes on. Nine countries, Belgium, Bulgaria, Denmark, Greece, Luxembourg, Latvia, Portugal, Slovakia, and Slovenia are listed as facing, quote, diminishing military ability or, most importantly, political will with regard to future reductions of aid. The document is derived from reporting by U.S. defense attaches in foreign capitals. Now, the whole story that we're being told in the mainstream media, Walter, and from the Biden administration is that Europe is united. There's no diminution of, of willpower on the part of European capitals. But in fact, this document shows just the opposite. And I think that the diminishing will to continue the war, to support the war, uh, to avoid negotiations in Europe and elsewhere, including the United States, that's going to continue to decline. I, I agree. I think that's true. I mean, we're always told that the international community stands behind Ukraine and the international community is essentially in support of the proxy war strategy pursued by the U.S. government. Uh, well, if the international community was so united, I mean, why would the United States feel the need to, to spy so heavily on their own allies? I mean, in addition to European powers who are, um, you know, close partners of the United States, many of them are NATO members. Uh, the documents also reveal or suggest that the United States was spying on the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, who, you know, is ostensibly the leader of the global community, right, the international community. Um, so, so clearly they're, they're very worried about this. Um, they don't see this situation as, you know, essentially in the bag for, for the desired outcome that the Pentagon wants, which is to, you know, essentially draw Russia into a, into a losing war, a protracted war that weakens its geopolitical uh, standing and, and internal stability. Um, they, they don't seem too confident about that. Part of it is their assessment of the uh, diminishing uh, stocks of ammunition that the Ukrainian armed forces have, especially as it relates to air defenses. Um, you know, here's another moment where we have to stop and think, okay, what other interests could be at play here? Uh, could this be misinformation designed to, you know, uh, accelerate the shipment of munitions to Ukraine? That's possible, but assuming that the documents are true, uh, it, it, it estimates that Ukraine will essentially uh, lose its ability to defend its airspace by the end of May, by the end of next month. Uh, very different, again, from the narrative in the corporate media. One of the other documents highlighted by Newsweek is that the number of what they describe as Russian mercenaries uh, in, the, in the Wagner Group or Wagner Group uh, is greater in some of the areas of conflict, uh, some of the hot battles, uh, than actual, you know, regular Russian troops. So this is 
like sort of presenting the picture that this is in essence a mercenary war, uh, a war by private contractors in essence, as opposed to Putin using you know the regular Russian army. And one of the headlines is 22,000 Wagner mercenaries, right? Now, one thing that I thought was really interesting about this, Walter, is it sounds like Russia's conducting a mercenary war in Ukraine. And then I was thinking like, well, what about the US war in Iraq? What about the US war in Afghanistan? In 2007, uh, according to a, a magazine article, a magazine piece written uh, in The Atlantic uh, by Kathy Gilsinen, uh, the, the United States by 2007 had more private contractors in Iraq than it had U.S. military forces. And it had hundred more than 100,000 U.S. troops in Iraq at that time. And here's what she writes. Even before the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq, Leslie Wayne documented the rise of contractors. These are mercenaries, right? These are people who are paid. They're private contractors. The rise of contractors in the New York Times, noting their roles in training U.S. troops in Kuwait and guarding Hamid Karzai, then Afghanistan's president. The pre quote, the Pentagon cannot go to war without them. During the Persian Gulf War in 1991, one of one out of every 50 people on the battlefield was an American civilian under contract. In Afghanistan, according to the latest US military figures from last fall, she wrote this in, in 2020, the ratio of American contractors to US troops was almost one to one, one to one, including local and third county, country contractors. So you had the Iraq war in 1990, one out of every 50 was a, a private contractor. Then the Bosnian war, it goes to one out of 25 or one out of 20. And as we continue to go through this period of endless US wars, the US government is relying on private contractors, but we don't call them mercenaries. Anyway, your thoughts. Right, absolutely. I mean, it's it's such a clear case of hypocrisy, even in terms of the language that's used. Uh, the Wagner Group, mercenaries, that's what they're referred to as in, in the media uh, and by politicians too. But in the United States, if you run a mercenary firm, you get to be called a PMC, a private military company. That sounds, you know, all very normal and regular and nothing to be alarmed about, as people understandably would be if they were referred to by what they are as, as mercenaries. Um, you know, the, uh, the Wagner group is also used as this kind of this boogeyman to raise the prospect or raise the accusation that Russia acts in an imperialist manner around the globe, that uh, Russia is essentially deploying the Wagner group to um, places like, you know, Mali, um, you know, other places in West Africa. Uh, and that essentially it's becoming this this instrument of Russian domination all around the world. So it's it's hypocritical both on the in the sense that uh, there are a lot of mercenary firms in the United States too that do a lot more than Wagner does. Uh, but but also you know the United States just has 800 foreign overseas military bases around the world. Uh, if if there is uh, this sense right that there's fewer U.S. mercenaries on the ground. Uh, it, it certainly could be attributed to the fact that the U.S. just has more regular personnel stationed in every region of the planet, organized into commands that cover uh, every corner of the globe. Again, before we leave this, I want to read uh, Los Angeles Times, July 4th, 2007, Independence Day. Iraq, private contractors outnumber U.S. troops in Iraq. This is another report. Uh, there were at that time 160,000 U.S. soldiers uh, in Iraq, 160,000. Uh, the U.S. government, the Pentagon, employed 180,000 what they call civilians who were in Iraq at the same time. And again, Walter, the language here is so important in terms of perception, because if the, if the U.S. government and the U.S. media was talking about this not as PMCs or private contractors, but called them mercenaries, and the American people were told, look, we went to war in Yugoslavia and before the, in, in 1999, in Bosnia, a part of Yugoslavia in 1995. 
And then we went to war in Afghanistan in 2001, in Iraq in 2003. And more than half of the force there employed by the Pentagon were actually private contractors slash mercenaries. That would really profoundly shape perceptions in the United States about what the U.S. was doing because people don't generally associate the use of mercenaries with wars that are fought for a noble cause, just the opposite. Uh, anyway, it's, it's such an important point about the language here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's extremely important, I think, uh, for the U.S. government to avoid the perception of there being, quote unquote, boots on the ground, right? The idea that massive numbers of U.S. combat troops are being committed to different war zones and that, you know, of course, subsequently, a lot of U.S. troops will die in those military adventures. Uh, that's a big political problem for the U.S. government. Uh, obviously, there was a huge problem during the Vietnam War. There was a big problem during the Iraq War. Uh, and the increasing use of, um, uh, of mercenaries, quote unquote, PMCs, uh, also, I mean, the same logic is at play with the increasing use of drones. They want to they wanna avoid that perception that there are American troops fighting and dying in all these wars that the U.S. government actually plays a central role in. It's, it's the same logic that animates the proxy war strategy in Ukraine as well. Let's have Ukrainians do the fighting and the dying in the quote unquote great power competition against Russia uh, because it will be more politically palatable for the U.S. public and there'll be subsequently less, po uh, less pressure on the U.S. government to change its new Cold War policy. I couldn't agree with you more. Walter, you and I were both at the March 18th protest organized by the Answer Coalition and other anti-war groups in Washington. There were other sister actions in other cities. Uh, and we had several thousand people there. It was very strong, politically very strong. But if the U.S. was sending its own troops in large number to fight on the battlefield in Ukraine, rather than using Ukrainians as a proxy we wouldn't have had several thousand people. We would have had several hundred thousand people. I mean, we would have had several hundred thousand people. We were organizing demonstrations before the Iraq war on October 26, 2022. We had 200,000, January 18th, 2003, two months before the war, a half a million. On February 15th, 35 million people around the world and 10 million people in the United States were in the streets against the Iraq war. This is history that's largely covered up. Even four days before the war, we called another short week, on, on day's notice, we called another demonstration in Washington. We had 100,000 people. And, you know, once the Iraqi resistance got going again after the fall of Baghdad, which happened around this time 20 years ago, April 9, 2003, the demonstrations again went to, like, we had 350,000 people in a united front anti-war action between the Answer Coalition and another anti-war group called United for Peace and Justice. That was September 24th, 2005. 350,000. Because Americans were being killed on the battlefield, the resistance of the Iraqi people was growing. And if the same thing was happening in Ukraine, it would be hundreds of thousands of people in the United States. So now you have Biden and Blinken and Jake Sullivan and Lloyd Austin and the and the Republicans uh, in Congress and the Republican Party leadership, the same, saying this is a noble cause. We have to go and we fight, but we're not going to send Americans. No, we're going to make sure Americans don't go. We're going to insist that this war not be expanded. But if it's so noble, if it's such a cause for liberation, why not send American troops? But it's not on the table because that would be politically impossible for the Biden administration to do that and then face the electorate in 2024. Right. I mean, this is very important to understand when we think about the framework of a Cold War. Um, I mean, calling it a Cold War, I mean, the historical Cold War or the new one that's shaping up now, uh, is, it's really a misnomer, right? Because there are lots of, quote unquote, hot wars that take place as a consequence of it. Uh, the U.S. government directs other political forces, other states around the world to conduct these proxy conflicts uh, in order to insulate the public, like the way that we've been talking about. 
Uh, but even if it appears to be a period of peace, a period of tense peace, where there's lots of you know, international geopolitical friction, but one in which the United States uh, armed forces is not you know, deployed to another country, there's not a declared war, uh, it's extremely important for the public to really grasp, for the people of the United States to really grasp, that this could uh, result in an unthinkable catastrophic confrontation between Russia and the United States, between the United States and China. I mean, we're, we're actually talking about nuclear war here. I mean, the largest nuclear armed powers being in a prolonged state of near warfare with each other. Uh, and, you know, these documents give us a sense of just how close to, you know, directly engaged in the Ukraine war the United States is. Um, you know, we, we have to act uh, and put pressure on the U.S. government with that in mind, with that eventuality in mind, because that's the path that the Biden administration and many administrations before it uh, have put us on. I want to step back and before we continue with some of the, the issues related to the war with, again, the story of the leak. The arrest of this young man, this 21-year-old National Guardsman, who seemed to be kind of showing off to his friends that he had top secret documents, there's elements of the story that I think I, I also want to emphasize. One is the documents are called top secret documents, right? Only people with top secret clearance can get those documents. And some people are saying, well, how did this 21-year-old National Guardsman get these documents? But Walter, 1.4 million people in the United States have top secret clearance, 1.4 million. And many, many, many documents are overclassified. And so that's one part of the story. Like why so many uh, top secret documents and at the same time, uh, if, it's so, if they're so top secret, why do 1.4 million people have top secret clearance in order to look at the documents? But then there's another thing, and we're looking at the footage of him being arrested. That was very dramatic, right? Here's this one guy, he's in shorts, he's 21 years old. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the mainstream media, they made the story, their story, their focus about how, how to catch him. They were, they were the ones, it wasn't actually the government, they were the ones who, quote, figured out who it was. They were the ones who, you know, tagged him. And presumably, if the same media had been given documents by somebody, top secret documents that showed like another side to a major foreign policy issue like the Ukraine war, uh, presumably if they were giving those documents to the New York Times, the New York Times would want to protect those sources, right? But here we are in a situation where the, the New York Times and the, Wells, and, the, and the Washington Post and the mainstream media are actually functioning not as an independent media, you know, critiquing the United States, but actually almost like an arm of the state trying to finger this person, identify this person. And it wasn't that hard since it was already on this chat, you know, uh, site for a long time. But it, again, when you think about the role of the media, here you have Julian Assange still in Belmarsh prison. The New York Times released the documents that, that Julian and WikiLeaks provided to the New York Times, so did the Washington Post, so did the Guardian, that showed them U.S. war crimes in Iraq. That was the Iraq war logs. And now today, as he sits in jail, in prison, for more than a decade, really, I mean, when you include the, his incarceration in the embassy, the Ecuadorian embassy in London, they're doing nothing to help Julian Assange they produced and published his materials, and now when new documents are being released that show or could show another side of the war, the way Daniel Ellsberg's Pentagon Papers showed that the American people had been lied to for 10 years about the Vietnam War, the same great free press in the United States focused on how to catch the guy. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. I I mean the the fairy tale version of the role of the media is to essentially um, you know keep the politicians, keep the people in power honest. That they're essentially this watchdog that makes sure that there's somebody peering over the shoulders of those involved in government decision making, so that the public can be informed as well. And it's you know an essential part of a well functioning democracy. 
Um, what you just laid out, Brian, what this situation shows uh, is an additional piece of proof that the opposite is actually true. That the media, um, you, the New York Times, CNN, Washington Post, you know, regardless of their political leaning partisan affiliation in the framework of, of you know, ruling class elite politics, they all serve essentially the same function, which is to be an echo chamber for the consensus positions of the elite of empire. Um, you know, the New York Times has been so completely committed to the new Cold War, especially against Russia. I mean, during when when the Russia Gate hysteria was kind of at its height, the New York Times was leading the charge. Uh, it's, you know, completely a logical continuation that they would behave this way uh, when it comes to these leaked documents. Um, the uh, the media companies also make a lot of money off of this, right? I mean, when there's big, dramatic, explosive news like this, that drives viewers to their channels, to their sites. So they're, they're perfectly happy to benefit from this uh, and, and watch people like Julian Assange, you know, languish in prison. I want to go to another one of the documents uh, covered in the Newsweek piece. Uh, it shows the level of how, it really shows the level of U.S. direction of the Ukrainian armed forces. And it, it doesn't say it openly, but, but it doesn't take a lot of reading between the lines to get this one. I'm going to read to you from the piece in Newsweek. U.S. intelligence is meticulously following the fighting around Bakhmut, mapping Russian troops down to individual trenches and tracking every electronic squawk from individual cell phones to radars. The soda straw view shows Bakhmut slowly falling into Russian hands. Now, aside from the battle in Bakhmut, if the U.S. is actually monitoring the trenches and getting every so-called electronic squawk, meaning every conversation that Russian troops are having with each other, or if they're calling home or talking to their, if the rank and file talking to their commanders, if this is true and the U.S. is sending the weapons to Ukraine and providing all of this intelligence, and now also the documents also show the U.S. is carrying out other operations like the Operation Phoenix Striking, I think it's called. And, I mean, if, you, if the U.S. has actually got all of this data, if their surveillance is so complete on everything, even down to who's saying what in every trench, that means the U.S. is in a commanding position for the Ukrainian armed forces. And again... Some people were surprised that the Ukrainian military had any successes at different times, and it certainly did have some successes. But I think it's inconceivable that it would have had any successes without the impact of the U.S. actually being the command and control operation for the entire war effort. That's right. I mean, to give one example of those um, successes by the Ukrainian armed forces that we can realistically or reasonably attribute to U.S. intelligence sharing, I mean, that, especially at the beginning of the war, uh, high-ranking Russian generals and other military officials were being killed in, in significant numbers because the Ukrainian armed forces were able to pinpoint their positions based on, you know, reportedly um, un undisciplined use of cell phones, right, that people would uh, use a device that set off an electronic signal that was identified, and then the area was uh, struck by artillery or whatever. Uh, and, and that led to high-ranking Russian generals dying. Um, Russia could reasonably interpret that as an act of war, right? Now that we know these things about electronic squawks, which, you know, I'm sure they knew that the United States had this capability before. But, but it seems uh, highly likely, highly likely that this type of advanced information uh, gathering technology is available to the United States and not to Ukraine. And in fact, the only way that the Ukrainian armed forces are get are able to access this is if it's given to them uh, by U.S. intelligence agencies. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know the uh, what, one more example actually. Um, the documents reference a strike that the Ukrainian armed forces carried out against an assembly point for Russian troops. Um, so there was a place where Russian soldiers were gathering. It was identified uh, thanks to the United States. 
Uh, and then the Ukrainian armed forces killed a lot of Russian soldiers. Uh, let's just think for a moment if the shoe was on the other foot. Let's say this was Afghanistan and not Ukraine. And Russia was able to identify the location of a large number of U.S. troops. They gave that information to the Taliban. And then the Taliban killed a lot of those U.S. troops. I mean, in that scenario, would the United States consider Russia to be a party to the war? Would it consider Russia to be engaged in war against the United States? I think, of course, it would. Uh, any nation would reasonably make that assessment. So the idea that the United States is, you know, just sort of hands off or helping our democratic friend defend their sovereignty. I mean, that's that's bogus. Right. I mean, the U.S. is clearly deeply involved in the uh, in the minutia of this war, in the day to day direction of this war. Well, speaking of minutia, one of the documents is about, quote, readying for the spring counteroffensive. That's the much talked about and anticipated spring offensive by the Ukrainian military uh, that's supposed to take place this month, end of April. The document shows a detailed breakdown of equipment pledged to Ukraine by combat brigade, all the way down to the combat brigade, noting the flow of military goods delivery schedules from January to April 2023 and the state of training of Ukrainian personnel. Now, this is all getting ready for the spring offensive. The document also indicates that all U.S. and allied training of Ukrainian forces is taking place outside of Ukraine. Now, whether that's true or not, that does clearly indicate the U.S. is working with the Ukrainian military to plan a spring offensive against Russia. They're going through in great detail about when all of the new weapons and equipment are coming, which brigade down to combat brigades is getting them completely scheduled. This is, again, Pentagon top secret documents, right? It's not like them. This is their sort of inventory and their scheduling. And it also shows that they're bringing large numbers of Ukrainian forces out of Ukraine for temporary periods of time at other NATO bases, undoubtedly in Europe, in order for the U.S. military to conduct the training with them. Walter, we have said from the beginning on this show, on the socialist program, that this is a proxy war, that the U.S. wanted the war, that the U.S. could have easily found a way to have a settlement with Russia before February 22nd, 2024, when Russia said it had red lines, when it, Russia amassed and made it very obvious that it was amassing large numbers of troops both in Belarus and, and on the eastern side of Ukraine in Russia. It was saying, we have red lines. We're not going to let Ukraine go into NATO. We're not going to let Ukraine be a staging ground for years, meaning the U.S. has advanced nuclear and conventional missiles that target us, positioned on our border. That's not going to happen. And during that whole time, the U.S. government was predicting that the Russians are going to, one, invade, and two, the U.S. announced that their political positions were such that none of the Russian demands were going to be accepted, that they were, quote, non-starters. So obviously, the U.S. knew they could have a negotiated settlement but chose not to have one. And then, uh, after the war is undertaken, is initiated, as, as predicted, uh, the U.S. then says, look, we're fighting a noble cause. Only military weapons and only in U.S. intelligence services and only the unity of all NATO countries can help push back the Russians when, in fact, the Russians were prepared not to go into Ukraine if there was a guarantee that Ukraine wasn't going to be used as a staging ground for a future war against Russia. Just the way the U.S. would say the same if the if, it, if the tables were turned, put the shoe on the other foot, as you said, if Russia was using Canada or Mexico as a staging ground for its um, advanced weapons against America just on the border of the United States, the U.S. would not accept it. Anyway, we, here's, here's what these documents show is, one, the U.S. wants the war to escalate with a spring offensive. They want Ukraine to win. They don't care if Ukrainians die. They want, they want more battlefield successes on the part of Ukraine, not because Ukraine will ultimately vanquish Russia, but just it will weaken Russia. I mean, that's obviously the entire point of this entire uh, U.S. proxy war. 
That's right. That's the strategic logic. The longer the war goes out, the deeper Russia's economic problems will get, the more Russian soldiers will die, the more political pressure there will be uh, internally in Russia on the government, the more opposition will be generated. Uh, and, and eventually the hope, I mean, the ultimate goal of the U.S. government is to bring about regime change in Russia. I mean, they, they want a compliant government like the, like the Yeltsin government that existed immediately following the fall of the Soviet Union that would be uh, subservient to the United States and would uh, not pose a challenge to U.S. regional domination in Europe or uh, the global hegemony of U.S. empire. Uh, that's their end game. And so if they can get all the way with the Ukraine war by prolonging it to the point that regime change takes place, that does not look likely at this point. But, you know, that's their their hope. Uh, they think, OK, that's great. They don't care how many people die as a consequence. If it just gets them part of the way, right, if this ends up weakening Russia, as Lloyd Austin has openly stated is the goal of the U.S. Uh, effort, uh, if this ends up weakening Russia and therefore weakening the camp in world politics that's opposed to the US dominated world system, uh, that's also a win for them. Again, the loss of life, the suffering, the dislocation, uh, that, that means nothing to the Pentagon war planners and the State Department strategists. Another document says, uh, talks about something called, the, as I mentioned earlier, the Phoenix Strike Operation. Now, I, I couldn't tell in my cursory examination of the documents if we learned that much more about it, but again, here's from the summary provided by Newsweek. The document contains reference to never before revealed Phoenix strike training that is taking place in France, Germany, and the Netherlands for Ukrainian special forces. Uh, anyway, Operation Phoenix strike. What is this, Walter? Do you know? That's right. Well, it appears that there are um, approximately uh, 100 U.S. Special Forces, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 100 you know, Western Special Forces soldiers inside of Ukraine. And then a lot of Ukrainian Special Forces troops are going to uh, allied governments in Europe or countries with allied governments in Europe and being trained there. Uh, to put them in a better position to return to the fight in Ukraine. Uh, another, you know, very just thin layer of separation between being a direct combatant in the conflict and being simply an ally of one of the sides. Uh, so the the presence of U.S. Special Operations Forces uh, inside of Ukraine, I think, is, is very significant as well. Um, the largest contingent, according to the documents, comes from the, the U.K., uh, but there, uh, you know, the, the very small number of special operators can have an outsized influence, uh, both in terms of the actual fighting, but, you know, maybe more importantly, in terms of the direct tactical direction of the forces fighting there. So that's a logic behind having troops there. And Phoenix Strike building up Ukraine's own special forces capabilities uh, is meant to have a similar impact on the battlefield. I want to, in future shows, go over and look more into this Operation uh, Phoenix Strike. You know, it, one of the things, Walter, this is disconnected, but the language of Phoenix is important, for, again, for people who are trying to learn a little bit about contemporary U.S. history. Uh, the U.S. had something called the Phoenix Program in Vietnam. Uh, the Phoenix Program was what, what was called a pacification program in South Vietnam. But when the documents came out, uh, CIA documents came out towards the end and then after the, after World War, after the end of the Vietnam War, and again during the church committee hearings in the mid-70s when there was an effort to reform the CIA and the FBI, the Phoenix program was, an, was a targeted killing program and about 80 to 90,000 Vietnamese villagers were targeted by CIA assassins. So the CIA would send these death squads into Vietnamese villages and take some people prisoner and, and tell them, look, we're gonna kill you or we're gonna kill your kids unless you tell us who are the sympathetic, the villagers who are sympathetic to the National Liberation Front, which was the, the front fighting in South Vietnam alongside the North uh, Vietnamese Army. So there was a reign of terror 
in Vietnam against villagers, and it was Operation the, the Phoenix Program, and about 80,000 people were targeted for killing. The fact that the Pentagon is continuing, because this became a big scandal once it really came out that the U.S. was actually running a death squad uh, system, a massive death squad system in Vietnam, in South Vietnam. It wasn't against the North Vietnamese. It's South Vietnamese who the U.S. said it was you know, fighting to liberate South Vietnamese people. Well, they were killing them, assassinating them. But the, the language is back, Operation Phoenix. And of course, there's the Phoenix Ghost Program, which is a, a secret or semi-secret drone program that the U.S. is also developing. There's a lot, Walter, that people in the United States, most of the story, we don't know. And the mainstream media, like the New York Times and the Washington Post, instead of encouraging whistleblowers or leakers to you know, be like Daniel Ellsberg and tell the truth and reveal documents to show how the government's lying about these wars, uh, the mainstream capitalist media content with trying to catch the leaker and send him to jail. And this young man who's been arrested now, if he in fact is the leaker, um, is facing 15 years in prison, of course. Uh, anyway, I just think it's really, we'll, we'll do it for our listeners and people watching the show. We're going to do a we're going to stay on the, on the trail of Operation Phoenix Strike and find out what this really, really is. Uh, I want to go on to the issue of negotiations, Walter. The top secret documents say there won't be any real negotiations in 2023. Okay, this is one of the stories where you absolutely don't need secret documents and that's one of the things that makes it quite astonishing to me, maybe even, you know, even additionally skeptical, because you don't need to see top secret documents to know that there aren't real negotiations because the U.S. doesn't want to negotiate. As a matter of fact, the reports earlier that there was third party uh, mediation efforts and a possible negotiated settlement way back when in, in 2022 between Zelensky and Putin, the U.S. was hostile to it. You don't need to read these documents to know the U.S. doesn't want negotiations. Yeah, that right, that's right. I mean, it goes back to their strategy of weakening Russia, of dragging out the, the conflict. Um, you know, the, the United States' position and the Ukrainian government's, um, you know, ostensible negotiating position, you know, what they would potentially consider as a settlement uh, means that, you know, Russia would... Uh, not only have to give up all of the territory that it was able to capture, uh, you know, since February 2022, but also to uh, return to Ukraine all of the territory that uh, voted to affiliate with the or to declare independence or if in the case of Crimea, affiliate with the Russian Federation uh, following the 2014 coup, the, the sort of opening of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, the U.S.-backed coup that overthrew the neutral government in 2014 and installed a pro-Western government. Um, that is that is never going to happen. I mean, that that's the type of thing you say when you do not want to negotiate and you just want to, you know, to appear not completely unreasonable, say something other than just flatly no, but something that you know is totally impossible, is, is effectively saying no. Um, that appears to continue to be their, their position, even though there are other significant ruling class forces, um, primarily in, in European countries, uh, that are becoming increasingly skeptical about the war. They're feeling the economic impacts of the war uh, more strongly. Um, you know, France is one of these countries, for instance, that, uh, you know, appears to be more open, more uh, hopeful that there can be some kind of negotiated uh, settlement sooner rather than later. Um, you know, the, the United States is, in addition to pursuing a conflict with Russia, also trying to keep all of its allies in line uh, along this, this super ultra hardline uh, position that will see the war drag on and on and on. Uh, and as that happens, the risk of catastrophic escalation will only grow. When, they, when the Russians came into Ukraine in, in end of February 2022, um, I wrote a piece and we talked about on the show that we had entered a new era of global politics, that the era... Uh, that started with the, with the fall of the Soviet Union and the collapse of the socialist camp that happened in the late 1980s. And then uh, obviously the Soviet Union implodes and collapses in early 1991. That that inaugurated a period of what we were calling, and others have also called, the era of unipolar domination. 
it wasn't a fully realized domination, but the U.S. pursued a path whereby it it basically publicly announced that it wasn't going to allow any rival to exist that challenged U.S. hegemony either regionally or globally, and that it was going to use military power, its military primacy or supremacy, principally or as the principal tool to enforce this kind of hegemonic design. And that for a long time, Russia and China essentially went along with the United States and in many areas, like in the case of the Libya war, uh, both Russia and China have uh, a veto at the UN Security Council. They both abstained when the US and Britain and France wanted UN authorization to carry out a bombing war against Libya. So they were, in a way, they didn't support the war against Libya, but they, they didn't want to challenge the US. They were, in essence, kind of appeasing the U.S. or not kind of very deliberately appeasing the U.S., except in their core interests, maybe in their own backyard, but not challenging U.S. Uh, global ambitions to be the world hegemon. Russia, by basically going to war with the U.S. and NATO, which it did by intervening in Ukraine, and it, it could fully anticipate that the U.S. and its allies would try to evict Russia from the world economy, as they tried to do, and that, uh, you know, it would be all-out, enduring, long-term confrontation between the West and Russia. When Russia did that, uh, they made a decision that they were bringing that era of appeasement, in essence, to an end. And this doesn't mean you have to support Russia. I'm not, that, my point isn't about, was this a good decision or a bad decision? My point is, this decisively started a new era of global politics. And we can see that that's true. Uh, Russia has not been completely devastated. It's found alternatives. Big parts of the global South, while not endorsing Russia, are certainly not endorsing the U.S. efforts to condemn Russia or to evict Russia. Many countries are increasing trade with Russia, not decreasing trade. And then you have Europe. And Europe, Walter, has, as you were just mentioning, been like such a key to U.S. hegemonic plans ever since the end of World War II when the U.S. reorganized global capitalism under its leadership, when the U.S. replaced the British Empire as the empire on which this, or for which the sun never set. It was that big. It was global. But now you have these signs that there's a diminishing political will in parts of the NATO countries to continue the war. Macron, and we're no friends of Macron here, we support the workers in France who are rising up against Macron, but Macron has been in China. He's basically endorsing the Chinese peace plan and the Chinese in turn are endorsing uh, French efforts to find a negotiated end to the war. I'm looking at one media source right here, and I'm going to, this is how we're going to wrap up today's show. The headline is China backs Macron's Ukraine peace efforts. Beijing supports European efforts to kickstart peace talks on Ukraine and eventually create balanced and sustainable security framework for the continent, according to Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin. Negotiations should be based on Europe's, quote, fundamental, this is, quote, fundamental long-term interests, close quote, that's from the Chinese, and should take into account, quote, the legitimate concerns of all parties, close quote, which, of course, means Russia. Uh, Wang was com uh, commenting on reported, the reported attempt by French President Emmanuel Macron to enlist Chinese assistance, Chinese assistance, to de-escalate the Ukraine conflict. Uh, finally, the spokesman noted the comments made by President Xi Jinping during Macron's visit to Beijing earlier this month when the Chinese leader stated that there can be no panaceas to the crisis. All parties must work to build mutual trust before progress can be made. Now, I've just been reading the European and some of the US media in the last two days, Walter, the media reports are becoming very hostile to Macron 
not because he's raging, raising the, secure, uh, the, the pensioners' age from 62 to 64 in France. They love that. The capitalist media in the West salutes Macron on that. But, salute, uh, but Macron is trying to carve an independent position with China, separate from the U.S. effort to keep the war going and not have negotiations by specifically finding a negotiated path uh, again, this, I think, could be very, very potentially important, even though the recent history, in recent decades, the European bourgeoisie, the European capitalists keep capitulating to the U.S., as they did after Trump ripped up the Iran nuclear arms deal. Uh, there are signs here that the U.S. is actually worried, clearly worried about Europe, and in this case, uh, now worried about Macron. Anyway, we're going to wrap up here. Walter, I want to get your take on this, because... Uh, every cause is an effect. Every effect is a cause. History keeps moving. Uh, it's been, since 1945, Europe has been under the thumb of the United States, but it won't be under the thumb of the United States forever. That's right. I mean, th this is a crucially important dynamic to watch. I mean, at the, at the onset of the conflict, it appeared that the war had the effect of actually cohering the U.S.-led bloc more. Uh, you know, all of these uh, countries that had been resisting raising their military spending, for instance, to the NATO target of 2% of GDP, uh, they were all falling over themselves to say, no, no, we'll meet, we'll meet our military spending commitment. We'll spend more money on the military. Uh, there is the expansion of NATO to Finland, which is very important. Um, countries were inviting more U.S. troops to be based uh, out of their territory. But as the war dragged on, as the economic cost became greater, and as public opinion, this is very important, as public opinion begins to turn against the war, uh, that appears to be turning into its opposite, at least, at least in some places and in some instances, where this U.S. policy of a truly open-ended war, um, long-term conflict in Ukraine, for as long as they can get it to last, essentially, is something that is not very appealing to the countries that are that are closer to the war zone and have more economic ties with Russia, especially when it comes to energy supplies. So, so the United States' own calculations may need to change if this dynamic uh, continues onwards. And, and finally, you know, the connection with the situation in China, I think, is hugely important. Uh, crucial that we look at what's going on in Ukraine and with Russia as one front of a broader Cold War strategy of the United States, the principal target of which actually is China more so than it is Russia. All right, we're going to leave it right there. Walter Smolarik, thanks so much for joining. Thank you for having me.